Morning, everybody. So I f I'm feeling a little trapped up here because I've been told I can't go past the TV. I'm a wanderer. How many of you guys are wanderers in your classrooms? You're all over the place, right? Me too. So I'm going to try to sort of hang here, which is going to make me a little crazy, but that's okay. Um, my name is Aida Awad. I'm a Google certified trainer. I'm also a um, high school administrator. I am the science department head at Maine East High School in Park Ridge, Illinois. Maine is a township in Chicago. Um, this is how you get to the presentation. See, I'm already off here. This is how you get to the presentation. GOO.GL slash three capital T small Q small F capital B case sensitive. If you don't know about the Google URL shortener yet, get there and find out. It's a great URL shortener. I think you'll love it. So I'm going to talk with you this morning about flipping your classroom. That URL shortener will be on a bunch of slides too, so you can hop in there and get it. Um, quick question to you. Think to yourselves, maybe talk to the person sitting next to you very quickly. What do you already know about this term, flipped classroom? What things come to mind? Content delivered outside the walls of the classroom. Anybody else want to add something? Creativity, thank you. I want to take this whole notion of flipped classroom, that definition that's out there that says something about we don't lecture in class anymore. We put our lectures on videos and the kids watch those at home and then they come to class and they do activities. You know that definition? I want to take that thing and I want to flip it. So I want to flip the whole idea to saying, let's flip learning. Let's flip the responsibility. Why are you guys all sitting here looking at me? Because I'm the teacher and that's how you were taught, right? Is that the way our students learn best? No. We should not be the center of the classroom. They should be. It should all be student-centered. We need to flip this thing. And that's what the flipped classroom is all about to me. So for the last year, we've been exploring flipped classroom in the class that I teach. And some of the things that I use to describe what a flipped classroom means, student-centered, very, very much student-centered. Mastery learning focused. When you hear mastery learning, what do you think of? You think of standards and learning targets and learning outcomes, but do you also think of students self-assessing and students being so committed to ma mastering those targets that they are really engaged and involved? Individualized learning. It's about the student. I said student, not students. It's about the student and their individualized learning. Engaged and connected, measurable outcomes. Data-driven, still data-driven, we still have to be able to show that they have learned. They still need to be able to demonstrate to us in some way that they have learned. It provides really strong 24-7 support through screencasts, through video podcasts, those kinds of things. It's standard-based, and it's really based on frequent and specific feedback, not only from the teacher, but peer-to-peer, -peer, very important, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning. If you like to think about Bloom's taxonomy, take Bloom's taxonomy and flip it. All the I can and I am statements. So I'm not going to focus on remembering. I'm not focusing on those lower levels. I'm focusing on the higher levels. Students are creating in my classroom. They're evaluating. They're analyzing. They're applying. They're doing those important kinds of things as ways to demonstrate what they've learned. So why all the fuss? I want to tell you a really, really short story. This student's name is Timmy Okadina. He was in my class this year. And he, in his application to go to Greenland this summer to study polar science, he wrote this. The moment science and I fell in love. Oh, right? Oh, my gosh. The moment so science and I fell in love, I realized the way for me to expand the love was to expand my horizons on how I interact with science. How he's interacting with science in my classroom is very different than what he's done in the past. When he fell in love with science, what he told me was one of the big sparks was through a Google Hangout. Oh my gosh. So we had a Hangout with a scientist from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Guy has been a um, deep diver in the Alvin submersible lots of times. And my students wrote questions. They did some research on this first. And then they wrote some questions that they were going to ask the scientist when he hung out with us in class. And Timmy was really sparked by some of the questions he got to ask. 
and the passion that he felt come through from this scientist in this hangout. He is actually at this very moment working with some grad students and a professor at University of Illinois Chicago. He's getting ready to go out in the field with them and collect samples so he can continue to work on this project that is called urban ichnology. Interesting stuff, but this is just one example of why all the fuss? Because we need to ignite. We need our kids falling in love with learning. So, lots of words on this slide because these are a few of all of the things that I use in my flipped classroom. I use Google Sites. What do I use them for? To host videos, to host assessments for learning, AFLs, for student e-portfolios. I use Google Forms for the assessments for learning. Self-grade them with Fluberoo. By the way, announcement, Fluberoo 3.0 is now out. Check it out. Um, YouTube to host and edit videos. And it's not just my videos. Guess who's making videos? You're darn right. Students are making the videos. They're capturing videos sometimes with their Chromebook, sometimes with their phones. They're putting it up on YouTube. They're doing all sorts of great things so that they can remember. They have a collection of their learning. Um, video Notes, anybody familiar with this app? Hit the Chrome Web Store, Video Notes, really cool app. I'll show it to you in a minute. Um, Google Docs, certainly, for student-centered collaboration. Google Maps and Google Earth, because this is a physical geology class, those are really important tools for us. Google Moderator, to collect ideas, to vote on questions so that it's students saying what's important for them. Google Plus Hangouts with scientists, we've got bloggers going, we're using Gmail and Calendar, of course, to keep things organized and moving along, and Picasa for our images. So, um, I want to jump out here really quickly to this site, and I want to show you the e-portfolio that my students create. It is a template that I give to them at the beginning of the year, and on that template, there are lots of things. You can see there's a whole bunch of units of study. This is where they are going to collect what they believe are important artifacts of their learning. I tell them the name of the unit they're studying. It's their collection. It's not mine. It's their learning. It's their collection. They are driving what's going in there. That's how they're helping me understand what they've learned and how they've learned it. They also set goals. And they're not goals about my class. They're goals about their future how that class, how the skills that they gain using all these amazing tools, how those skills are going to support them in their learning in the future and support them you know, both inside and outside school. They're setting up an educational plan, and there's got to be some stuff about them. They love to put their pictures in there. They love to tell their story. That's part of the e-portfolio. It's not just their learning. It's everything that they think about and do in that class. Google Forms. You guys love Google Forms? Does everybody love the fact that you can now embed images in Google Forms? We asked for that for a long time. Thank you, Google, for bringing that recently to us. The new forms are amazing. So forms go into the class website. That's where students have access to the forms. So if you're a student in my class, yes, you do watch videos of me and a couple of other teachers that teach the same class. And we make our slides in Google Presentations. And we provi provide those slides to the students. They take notes on them. They can add comments to them if they make a copy of it. They're watching the videos. And they're using those videos to go through and figure out what was really, really important from that video. And they're demonstrating to us that they have understood the content on that video through taking this quiz, right? You know that old word? It's OK. <laughs> They're taking this quick quiz after they watch the video. And then we can look at the results really fast on a summary of responses, right? So isn't that nice to have the picture right in the form? Yeah, I said that twice. That's how they're telling us that they've seen the video, that they have the basic understanding. It's a lot of vocabulary. That's the very beginning. Now they have to go out and really demonstrate that they can do something with the vocabulary and that very basic understanding that they've gained. So they've taken what we need them to know as basics. Now they have to make that learning theirs. 
They have to apply it. They have to find ways to make meaning out of it. So the videos, back to this just for a second, the videos we do host on YouTube, they are also embedded into our class website. So the students can hop on their phones and watch the video. How many of you guys have concerns with students not having access all the time? But they've always got their phones with them, right? And they have smartphones, and they love to watch YouTube videos. So, you know, darn it, if they don't watch the video at night, if they're watching it in the morning before class, or if they have to watch it during class sometimes to kind of get caught up, that's okay. It's about their learning. It's centered on them. So we use YouTube so that we can get those videos out there to them. We also, as I said, have students who do their own videos. So let me just show you a really, really short clip of a video here. Uh, that's not the one I wanted. That's not the one I wanted. Where is it? Where did it go? Where did it go? There it is. Okay, I want to set this up for you for a second. Looks kind of messy, huh? Okay, this is an experiment that's called a stream table. And what we do is we have one of those big Rubbermaid storage boxes, and we fill that up with sand, and there's a hose that is at one end and a drain at the other end, and you turn the hose on, and guess what happens? The water flows through, and it creates all sorts of, or all sorts of stream features. So the students have already learned the basics of the stream features from the video. They've already used Google Docs to collaborate on collecting images and definitions for those stream features. And now they're going to see it in progress. They're going to see if they can figure out the process of formation of each of those features and make some connections back to the real world. So let me just play this really short clip for you. Hopefully the volume will work. Oops. Because it wants to go this way only, so it clogs up all this stuff so it can't run. You know, all the sediment clogs this up, so it can only go one way. And that's why this one's stopping. You see how this one's slowing down? Now it's starting up again. Because I took all the sand before, remember? Do you see how this one's already dry? Like, barely any. See? So what? Got a question. Oh, darn. They have a question about their own work there. <laughs> So what they were talking about at the beginning before I got the volume to work really well was that that's what's happening around New Orleans. So the Mississippi River wants to really go down the Atchafalaya. It doesn't want to go down the Mississippi Channel. And that's what they were showing is it's trying to go a different way, but what's happening? So they're taking the vocabulary that they learned. They collaborated on learning that. They learned some of it from the video. They learned some of it from the book. They learned some of it from each other. Oh, darn. And now they're putting that into practice in their lab, and they're making connections back to the real world. Kind of cool, right? But remember, this happens because it's not focused on me as the teacher. It's focused on them. So there were other groups of students. This was only three. There were other groups of students that were working on way different parts of this project at this point. They're all over the place. It makes for kind of a chaotic classroom, but that's OK. So here's video notes. Let me jump out here and show you this quickly. So here's what video notes is about. You find a YouTube video, and you put the URL in, and the video pops up on this side of the screen. As you play the video, you type your notes over here. And the notes get synced to the video. So if I were to click on different parts of my notes here, it would jump to that part of the video. How cool is that? So can you imagine you're doing a flipped classroom or you're just doing screencasts and you've got kids who are watching a 10-minute video and they need to go back to three minutes into the video. What are they doing? Are they writing that down in their notes? Oh, I got to go back to three minutes? No, all they have to do is type their notes here, click on that note, it goes right back to that point in the video. And guess what the best part of this is? This gets saved in your drive. It's searchable. They go into their drive, they have video notes for whatever the video was, and they open it right out of their Google Drive. Cool, right? Yeah. Okay. So that is a Chrome Web Store app. Hop out and grab it. Um, I wanted to show you lots of things with the documents and the spreadsheets and the drawings and the slides and Google Earth and Google Maps that they're doing. But I know I'm not going to have a long time, so I want to show you one very cool thing. 
This is a lab that's called a flubber lab. Everybody knows flubber, that fun stuff kind of like Play-Doh, right? So we're studying climate change at this point in our curriculum. And students are concerned about what's happening with the ice sheet on Greenland, the ice sheet on Antarctica as it's melting. And they don't really know the whole physics of ice flow and ice motion, and they need to learn that. So they're learning it through this lab. As they're doing this lab in class, they're taking video of it. So picture this. They have a PVC pipe, and it's cut in half. So it looks like a big white trough. And it's balanced up on a stack of textbooks on one end. This is real high tech, right? <laughs> stack of textbooks on one end and the table on the other end. And they've got flubber, and the flubber is placed into the top of that channel. And then they're videoing as the flubber flows down the channel. And it actually flows in the same way that glacial ice flows. It simulates glacial ice. So they can collect data. And where do they put their data? In their Google spreadsheet. As a matter of fact, they're collecting data, and so are other classes, and so are other students in that class. So they have data not only theirs, but a whole bunch of other kids' data, too. And they're able to do lots of different surfaces, collect times, distances, the slope that it was flowing over. And then what do they do with that data? They take it and they put it into a motion graph, which is a gadget that you can embed into your Google spreadsheet. And we're going to look at distance over time here on this motion graph. And we're just going to make it do some different colors. And we're going to turn on um, cold and room temperature, and out of the microwave warm, and we're just going to click play, and we're going to see what we see here. So what are we seeing? We're seeing a time series graph. And what the time series graph is showing us, remember this is out of their Google spreadsheet, their data, lots of data. It's showing us the different slope, distance over time, so the different rate that this flubber is flowing. And they're thinking about what happens when we warm up the atmosphere to the flow rate of glacial ice. What happens when it gets to the end and it's melting? How is this all working? And here they have data to talk about what we see in the real world in terms of data and what their experimental data was. Can they make comparisons between those two? Can they talk about error? What skills are they learning in doing this? Got spreadsheets going, you got graphs going, all their data, data from other students. Really great use of that tool. So when you hop on here, all these links are live. Go and look at some of the documents they're creating. Go and look at some of their slides. Look at some of their drawings, amazing drawings that the students have made to try to explain and diagram what they've learned. And then if you've got Google Earth, hop on there. There's a KMZ to a, a pretty cool file. You can hop on there and take a look. Google Moderator. How many people have seen Google Moderator? If you haven't seen it, you don't know it's out there, let me tell you very quickly how it works. Students put in questions, whatever questions they want to ask about something, and then they vote on each other's questions. And the questions that get the most votes rise to the top. So when we hop on a hangout with a scientist, the questions that most of the students wanted to hear responses to, those are at the top. They get asked first. And we get through whatever we can get through, but we know we got the ones that everybody wanted to hear about. We use Blogger to kind of keep our conversations going. Students love to converse with each other about this. This is not just one class. This is multiple classes of students who are talking about the content. Can you imagine that? Because it's all about them and their learning, and they know that. We do have to keep this kind of organized chaos under control a little bit, so we do put out a calendar, which of course is embedded in the class website. And the calendar helps kids know kind of where they should be. If they're not there all at the same time, they know that's OK, because they know it's about their learning. But we do put that calendar out there, and we do communicate with them through Gmail and our Google Groups as well. Picasa is a great thing for images. Geology is very, very visual. So we're using Picasa and slideshows to help them keep track of diagrams and images and embed those into their own ePortfolio sites. So um, that was really fast, kind of tour through some of the things that we're doing with Flip Classroom and some of the tools that we're using and the way that we're making Google Apps for Ed 
work to help our students learn and help our students fall in love with you fill in the blank. So please keep the conversation going. Talk with each other about what it is that you want to do with your students and what tools there are out there to help you. Get in contact with me, um, aawad6 at gmail.com, Twitter at aawad. Hop on the URL for the slideshow. Thanks very much for your energy. Appreciate it very much. Have a great day, guys.